So, what is something to be desired? Uh, well, I, uh... Maybe it's about, um... <laughs> it's just about, um, you know, this group of friends in Pittsburgh trying to figure out what they want to do. And they're all in that early adulthood period of transition, and they're really trying to find their footing on something right now, and that means career and relationships and understanding yourself. That's what I was going to say. Amani Channel, this is WebVideoChefs.com, and you know we like to have the stars of the internet featured here to share their information with you. We got a special guest, Justin Kanaki, coming to us from Baltimore, Maryland. He is an internet uh, online content producer, also a social media strategist who goes way back in the realm of online video, also episodic um, show creation. He's one of the real pioneers of it online. Thanks so much, Justin, for joining us. Not a problem. Thanks for having me. So, so Justin, I know we were sort of chatting before we started rolling here just about your background. Um, you, you have two shows that you've sort of created uh, during your, your history here, uh, Something to be Desired as well as The Breezes, which is your latest show, um, which are episodic shows that are on the Internet, of course. Um, talk a little bit about, for those who are interested in creating like a sitcom, a episodic kind of serial show, um, talk a little bit about your background. What inspires you to, to get into this and, and tell us about you know, how long you've been doing this? Yeah. Uh, well, when I graduated from college back in 1999, I had the idea for a short film, basically, uh, that was based on my experiences as an independent uh, college radio DJ, uh, like five years prior. So I wrote this idea out. I sort of knew where the beginning and the end was, and I figured, okay, we can make this in, into a short film. But you could also keep telling the story beyond the end point of the film. And that was something that became really attractive to me. I started writing these characters and finding their voices and realizing I don't want to stop their story because I know they'll probably have more interesting stories down the line. So what do you do with the story that you want to keep alive? Well, you have to tell it in a serialized format. And I knew I wasn't going to create something and pitch it to TV at random because I didn't have any contacts at the time, but I did have access to the Internet. So in 1999, I toyed with the idea of doing serialized content and then People who are much wiser than me said there's no reason to try it yet because there's no broadband penetration in the United States. You know, you're going to be downloading things on AOL for hours to get one minute clips. Just not worth it. So I tabled that until about 2003 when I was working for a multimedia company that had uh, extra cameras and extra time that they weren't being used. So I put them to good use shooting the first five episodes of the series and then releasing it online at a time when finally people were starting to get interested in web video but still didn't know what to make of it. We spent like the first two or three years of the show answering questions like, oh, so you want to be on cable access someday? And we would say, uh-uh, no, we want to be on the internet because someday it's all going to be the same box, your TV, your radio, your interwebs. It won't matter because you'll just get the same content from the same uh, producers no matter what kind of distribution mechanism that you're using. So we knew that back then. It was just a matter of waiting for the audience to catch up with us. And now here we are eight years later, still making the same kinds of shows we've wanted to because we really enjoy the creative process and the feedback that we get in real time from the audience. So uh, this is actually uh, something to be desired actually is an award-winning show. Talk a little bit about um, how you went about producing it, how you got it online even in the early days and, and um, what led you to your current show that you're producing now. We'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we started uh, doing the show as an experiment and the cast wanted to continue it because they really enjoyed the characters. So we kept tinkering with it and finding new ways to tell the story and new ways to adapt to our ever-changing locations. Because when you're shooting something on a shoestring budget, you're kind of at the mercy of what people will let you do for free. So we kept the show alive uh, you know, on chewing gum and, and string for a few years. And then as YouTube came out and made web video sort of a household thing, we were able to get front paged on YouTube and Yahoo a few times which started to bring in viewers by the tens of thousands rather than the hundreds and thousands we'd been getting on our own before. So that little bump got us a nice um, validation in the eyes of people who had seen enough web video to know the good from the bad. So the cast sort of took that to heart, and we had our second wind of, uh, of a creative rejuvenation on the show. Uh, around 2008, Yahoo nominated us for a Best Web Video Series awards. We were in the same category with uh, The Guild and Break a Leg and some other really big names, which was nice. Uh, again, nice validation. And then in 2009, when I moved to Baltimore, we put the show on hold because we couldn't produce a show from Pittsburgh when I didn't live there. And we finally solved that problem back in uh, about a year ago now, in 2010. Uh, the cast wanted to keep the show going, and the fans wanted to keep the show going. 
So we turned to Kickstarter to get some uh, kicking cash of about $3,000 uh, just to get the ball rolling, to get our first few episodes up of a spinoff from Something to be Desired, which we're calling The Baristas. It takes place just in the cafe portion of the Something to be Desired universe. has a lot of the same characters, plus some new ones, and uh, has a lot of the same fans who are watching Something to be Desired, plus a new audience that we're starting to generate now, which is actual baristas who find the show, and they can sort of see parallels to our bizarre fictional world and the real world of a Starbucks or a local coffee shop they happen to work in and see, oh, these are the same personality types I deal with in real life. I'm going to keep watching this because I can live vicariously through these characters, which has been pretty fun. So, so you mentioned uh, you started with the shoestring budget with uh, Something to be Desired. Um, how are you able to keep the show going, keep the cast members happy, all the production that goes into shooting, editing, and, and getting everything finalized for the internet? Um, how did you manage to keep, even keep your drive going to, to do that for all these years? If you ask the people who know me well, they know that that drive has sort of come and gone because there are times when I'm up at 5 o'clock in the morning and haven't slept for days and I'm still editing video uh, just to put something out on a Monday and it can be a little uh, resource depleting internally. But the fact is, we really enjoy the collaborative process. I've had cast members who've worked on the show who have then gone on and done other things, other films, other, other uh, web series, in fact, and they keep coming back to our show because they just enjoy the energy that like the the creative family that we've become on the show so that alone is enough to keep us uh interested in fueling the show and finding more and more ways for other brand new audiences to find it and then go back and look and see oh there's eight years worth of episodes i can go back and look through as well it's like a, a rich aha moment when they notice this and realize they can invest themselves in this world as viewers so that's cool uh, as far as the financial aspects of it go, so we had some Kickstarter money to help out with. I allocate uh, probably too large a portion of my own income to keep the show going as well. Uh, we do get ad revenue from Blip TV, but if you are familiar with ad revenues from Blip TV and other sorts of online ad uh, mechanisms, you know these rarely are enough unless you're getting hundreds of thousands and more of views to really pay very much in terms of expenses. So the next step for us is merchandising and sponsorships. So, for example, being a Pittsburgh-based show, we've had discussions with Pittsburgh-based um, brand names and retailers who might be interested in uh, involving themselves in their brands, either in uh, on-screen sponsorships or in product placements, uh, because we know we have a really uh, we have two solid demographics of viewers right now for our show: people in Pittsburgh and baristas. So anybody who appeals to those two demographics from a retail point of view or a lifestyle point of view has a reason to want to reach them through our show. So now we're starting to segment ourselves, marketing. So, so give me a whole, um, what's the plot, the ongoing plot of baristas? Uh, what, what's, what's it about? That's a fabulous question. Uh, so something to be desired started out as a show about a, people, a particular, bunch of people in a radio station. Great. Eventually, we morphed out of the radio station into a book publishing company. Great. Eventually, those characters then relocated into a cafe. Great. So the basic premise of the show is always sort of a workplace comedy. Yet, the one thing I've noticed as a freelancer from being in coffee shops throughout my career, since I can work from home or from the road, uh, is I love the idea of going into a cafe, mm -hmm. becoming a regular there, and slowly getting to know the life stories of all the other regulars and the employees who are coming in. Because it's like you walk in, you get your cup of coffee for the day, you glimpse part of their story, and then over time you start to put the pieces together yourself. You start to intuit what are all their relationships. Uh, you know, who likes whom? Who has a previous history with whom? So I wanted to create a fictional world where you as an online viewer can keep stopping in on a regular basis and getting more and more of an understanding of how these characters all fit together. So from that point of view, that's sort of the mood, the theme of the, of the show. But from a strict plot-based standpoint, uh, this cafe is not a cafe that does very well financially. In fact, the real-life cafe that we film in is a working, operating cafe, and it's up for sale right now. So it's almost like art imitates life in a weird way. As we're filming the show, we don't even know if we're going to have the location for very long. Wow. Funny. So uh, we sort of have a reason to keep telling the story as fast as possible. Uh, so you have these characters who 
each of them approaches their job from a different point of view. Either they just need it for the money or they just need it for a creative outlet or they just need it because nobody else will hire them, that sort of a thing. And when they're forced to rally together around the fact the cafe itself might not stay open, both in reality and on the show, they have to find creative ways to keep solving these problems. And right now, as we introduce our next nine brand new episodes, the cafe has a brand new owner. And uh, that owner has zero business experience, but 100% ego, and is about to run the place into the ground unless somebody does something. So we'll see how these characters, who really have no backbone, no spine, and no uh, way to solve this problem, find a way to do it, or die trying. All right, so what we're going to do right now, we're going to pause and, and, and show a clip from your show. Um, just think about it, introduce what clip you want us to, to show for the audience, and uh, set it up for us. Hmm, interesting question. Uh, what I can do, actually. Why don't we take a look at the very beginning of the first episode of The Baristas, which is about a two-minute clip in which you get to meet almost all of the main recurring characters uh, coming in and out of the cafe for their day's business, whether they're employees or regulars. And it gives you sort of a taste of the uh, sense of humor that the show uh, generates. Turns out the smell was leftover Chinese in the passenger seat. Oh, God. Of course, I haven't had Chinese in a long time. Ooh. Oh, did you do that? Well, you know what they say, you can't spell Madison without all. Oh, <laughs> Madison. I mean, there's only one A, but if you stretch it, I guess. Look what she did. It's a heart. Yeah, she did that on mine, too. This is bigger. Thanks for noticing. Very good. Look, okay. We got a system here. Okay, Madison flirts with the boys, you flirt with the girls. But okay. Scott and I... No, 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 no. The girls, Carrie. Okay. Take it from me. How many more of these do you have? Eight boxes of scones, scones, scones. Eight boxes? Yeah. You fit all that in a Prius. Divine physics is fun. Tiabitha. Coffee. Room for cream? Yes, Irish. Rich? Give me an almond rocus steamer, double pump, half skim, half soy. Yes to whipped cream, and let's keep it in the cup this time, not dribbling down the side. We're not in Russia. Glenn, usual? Yeah. Amy? <sighs> Surprise me. Nothing tastes the same twice here anyway. What the sack? I get my drink in a landfill timeshare and somehow Glenn gets his own mug. Glenn comes in every day, only orders decaf, and he only causes trouble when he overhears something he shouldn't. You only come in when you have a coupon. You order the most asinine drinks that no one has ever even heard of. You're rude, you're sexist, and you never tip. This would never happen at Starbucks. Starbucks banned you for life when they caught you downloading hentai porn in their bathroom. I believe it is pronounced hentai. Oh, excuse me. And at least they were polite about it. Seriously, ready whip? What am I, in prison? Listen to 